Welcome to the Science of Success, the number one evidence-based growth podcast on the internet, bringing the world's top experts right to you. Introducing your hosts, Matt Bodner and Austin Fable. Welcome to the Science of Success, the number one evidence-based growth podcast on the internet, with more than 5 million downloads and listeners in over 100 countries. In this episode, we bring back one of our all-time greatest interviews from the archives and share everything you ever wanted to know about sleep with one of the world's preeminent sleep experts, Dr. Matthew Walker. This is seriously one of my favorite podcasts that we've ever done, and Matthew Walker's work is truly important and impactful. Now, more than ever, I think we all need to understand the power of a good night's rest. Are you a fan of the show, and have you been enjoying the content that we put together for you? If you have, I would love it if you signed up for our email list. We have some amazing content on there along with a really great free course that we put a ton of time into called How to Create Time for What Matters Most in Your Life. If that sounds exciting and interesting and you want a bunch of other free goodies and giveaways along with that, just go to successpodcast.com. You can sign up right on the homepage. That's successpodcast.com. Or if you're on your phone right now, All you have to do is text the word SMARTER, that's S-M-A-R-T-E-R, to the number 44222. In our previous episode, we shared insightful lessons from selling over a thousand companies, what really matters when you're building a business, how to grow companies, and what mistakes to avoid if you want to exit big with our previous guest, Michelle Seiler Tucker. Now, for our interview with Matthew. Today, we have another fascinating guest on the show, Dr. Matthew Walker. He's a professor of neuroscience and psychology at UC Berkeley and the founder and the director of the Center for Human Sleep Science. He's published over 100 scientific studies and is the author of the book, Why We Sleep, Unlocking the Power of Sleep and Dreams, which is currently the number one Amazon bestseller in the neuroscience category. He's been featured on TV, radio, including CBS's 60 Minutes, National Geographic, and much more. Matt, welcome to the Science of Success. Well, it's a pleasure to be on, Matt, and thank you for having me. Well, we're very excited to have you on here today. So I'd love to begin the conversation and and kind of talk a little bit about, as I think you've sort of called it, the sleep deprivation epidemic and kind of what what happens to us when we don't get enough sleep. You're right. There is currently a global sleep loss epidemic. This is sweeping developed nations. It's been underway for probably about uh, 60 or 70 years We know from surveys back in the 1940s that the average American adult was sleeping 7.9 hours a night. Now we know that number is down to 6 hours and 31 minutes during the week for American adults. Back in my home country, not much better. It's 6 hours and 49 minutes on average people are sleeping. Japan seems to be the worst, 6 hours and 22 minutes. And I just give you those numbers to reaffirm firstly this pernicious erosion of sleep that has happened over the past 70 or 80 years as as truth but also just to take a step back we i think we have to realize that it took mother nature 3.6 million years to put this necessity of eight hours of sleep in place and then we have come along and in the space of blink of an evolutionary eye 60, 70 years, we've lopped off maybe 20, 25% of that sleep amount. How could it not come with deleterious consequences? So I think it's been proudly confirmed that we are in a global sleep loss state of deficiency or an epidemic as the CDC and the World Health Organization have caused it called it, sorry. What are the consequences though? Because if it's not doing us any harm, then why worry? And if only that were true, there is demonstrable harm that is underway because of this sleep loss epidemic. We can start at the big 30,000 foot level and make a very simple statement based on epidemiological studies from millions of people. And that is the shorter your sleep, the shorter your life. Um, Short sleep predicts all cause mortality. So I think that that sort of classic old maxim that you may have heard, you know, you can sleep when you're dead. Um, it's always it's always struck me as ironic because if you adopt that mindset, we know from the evidence that you will be both dead sooner and the quality of that now shorter life will be significantly worse. 
if you dig down a little deeper, you can say, well, if a lack of sleep uh, kills you more quickly, then what is it that is killing you more quickly? And it seems to be just about everything. Every major disease that is killing us in the developed world has causal and significant links to a lack of sleep. That list currently and tragically includes Alzheimer's disease, cancer, cardiovascular disease, stroke, diabetes, as well as numerous mental health conditions, depression, bipolar disorder, and most recently, and, and sadly, suicide as well. So I think we're really now starting to understand not just how deathly a lack of sleep is and the current weight of our sleep deprivation, and that that elastic band of sleep deprivation can stretch only so far before it snaps, but we're also understanding from hard science exactly why a lack of sleep produces such disease, sickness, and ill health within the brain and the body. It's amazing. And, and you know, it's, it's so important to, to think about why sleep is so vital. And yet, in, in today's society, you know, it seems like there's more and more of a push to sleep less, work more, hustle more, do more. How do we combat that? There is. And I think currently sleep has an image problem in society. Because more often than not, we seem to stigmatize sleep and we suggest that people who are getting sufficient sleep, and I actually choose my words quite carefully there, as being lazy, as being slothful, those who get maybe seven or eight hours of sleep a night. And people I think are, or some people I should say, not all, but some people are perhaps quite proud of the fact of how little sleep that they're getting and wear it almost as though it's a badge of honor to be celebrated. And it's, it's sad because for all of the reasons that we've just discussed, it's an ill-advised mentality to, to expose. But it's also strange because we don't always have that opinion. I don't think any of us would look at an infant sleeping during the day and say, gosh, you know, what a lazy baby. And, and we don't do that because we know that sleep at that time of life is absolutely non-negotiable. It's fundamentally necessary. But if you look at the evidence, somewhere between infancy and now, even childhood, not only do we abandon this notion that sleep is necessary and important, but we, we give it this terrible stigma. So I think that that attitude has to change, and it, there are many ways in which it has to change. But I think part of the problem, perhaps, is that the science of sleep has actually not been adequately uh, communicated to the public. And I think it's people like myself who are to blame. You know, I'm a sleep scientist. I've been a uh, professor and a sleep scientist for 20 years now. And I can't go around wagging the finger at people if people have not been educated by the science that their taxpayer dollars have funded. And that was part of the motivation to write the book, that I didn't feel as though there was a book out there that gave people a blueprint manifesto of all of the real hard science of sleep. There are lots of books out there that you can buy about sort of, you know, the quick fix. These are the 10 rules to better sleep. Or, and I'm, I've got nothing against those types of books. But for me, I felt it was important because my sense is that people don't respond to rules. They respond to reasons rather than rules. And I wanted to give and write a book of reasons for why you should sleep rather than rules for how to sleep. So I want to dig a little bit more specifically into some of the kind of negative implications or maybe kind of the flip side of why sleep is so important for certain activities. So for somebody who, you know, let's let's contextualize this maybe within a work framework broadly thinking about if I want to get more work done, you know, people often say, all right, I'm going to sleep less or I'm going to pull an all nighter or, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to cut down on my sleep so I can be more productive. How does that usually pan out? What does the science say about doing that? It doesn't pan out very well. And in fact, the opposite is true. We now know that less sleep does not equal more productivity. There have been lots of sort of laboratory and uh, workplace studies, and they give us five clear truths. Firstly, underslept employees tend to take on less challenging work problems. In other words, they opt for the easy way out. 
underslept employees actually produce fewer creative solutions to work problems that they're facing. They also actually exert less effort when working in groups, and we've done some of this work. They essentially slack off. It's what we call social loafing. So they ride the coattail of others and sort of try to claim their hard work as their own. We also know very interestingly that underslept employees are more likely to lie, cheat, and engage in deviant behaviors such as falsifying uh, claims receipts, et cetera. And it's a scaling function. The less sleep that you have, the more likely you are to, to lie in and be deviant. What's also interesting is that it scales the business hierarchy all the way up to the top. We know that the more or less sleep that a business leader has had, the more or less charismatic their employees will rate that business leader, even though they, the employees themselves know nothing about how much sleep that that business leader has had. They can actually see it in the expression of the, uh, of the behavior of their leader. You can then actually scale that up from those sort of low level studies all the way up to the higher level studies. And there was a recent uh, RAND report, an independent report that demonstrated that chronic exhaustion and fatigue due to a lack of sleep cost most first world nations about 2% of their GDP. So for the United States, that's $411 billion that we lose each year due to a lack of sleep. So if you can just sort of think about that, if we solve the sleep deprivation problem in the US, you know, we could almost double the budget for education and we could make huge inroads into the problems that we have with healthcare, or we could just flat out give people remarkably high tax rebates simply by solving this sleep loss epidemic. So I think in response to your question, it's very clear that underslept uh, individuals are not going to be successful. You know, it's, it's a little bit like if you think about your workforce and you're forcing them to come into work every morning early and leave very late so no one's getting enough sleep. It strikes me a little bit like a spin class at a gym. You know, everyone in the office looks like they're working hard, but the scenery never changes. There's never any forward progression in terms of momentum with productivity and creativity. So I think we need to change our attitude in the workplace regarding sleep. The evidence is very clear there. You know, the especially around the the creativity and, and the productivity aspect of that, it makes me think almost about the uh, kind of uh, an applied version of the 80-20 principle where it's not necessarily just more hours of work equals more output, but it's really, you know, vital to have quality work where you're creative, where you're bringing a fresh perspective and, and, uh, you know, a well-rested mind. And that's when you really produce value. But when you, you know, that's kind of the 20% that produces 80% of your results, but all the sort of busy work and the, the, you know, the hustle and bustle if you don't get enough sleep, you're not going to be able to really be incredibly productive. I think that that's very true. Is there a way that we could actually break the sort of the the classic Pareto sort of 80-20 law that's common throughout nature and it's applied to human beings as well by way of manipulating sleep? Could we actually, you know, force it to be that it's 30 or 40% of your workforce that returns now, you know, 80 or 90% of the productivity by way of sufficient sleep. But it's really, it, it's just coming down to the very fact that, you know, what is the recycle rate of a human being? I think people have failed in the workplace to actually face this question and ask it. And it's surprising because people in the workplace are wonderfully astute at trying to squeeze every ounce of effectiveness and efficiency out of all of their systems, be it, you know, their budget, be it their tax, be it their hardware, be it their software. And I think we forget about the the biological organism at the heart of most companies, the human beings themselves. And we have to ask, you know, how long can an individual be awake before they decline and decline significantly in their productivity, efficiency, and effectiveness? And we now know that that evidence, you need uh, eight hours of sleep, 16 hours after 16 hours of wakefulness, the cognitive capacities and the physiological uh, capacities of the body start to decline dramatically. You know, after about 20 or 21 hours of being awake, you are as cognitively impaired as someone who would be legally drunk in terms of driving behind the wheel. 
So, so there really is a recycle refresh rate of a human being, and we know that, and it declines dramatically once you get past that 16. And, and what I'm suggesting there is not 16 hours of work. I'm suggesting that you know, there's you know, an eight and nine hour work span, then people need that downtime and they need to get that eight hours of sleep to reboot and refresh. So what's actually happening during that kind of recycling period? Well, we know firstly that there are multiple different stages of sleep that we ebb and flow in and out of throughout a full eight hour phase. And those different stages of sleep and the two principal types of sleep I should note um, that probably most people are aware of are what are called non-rapid eye movement sleep or non-REM sleep and rapid eye movement sleep or REM sleep, which is the stage principally from which we dream. And non-REM sleep actually has several sub-stages to it, stages one through four, increasing in their depth of sleep. And <laughs> by the way, I have to always, it always strikes me as funny that we're, scientists are not a very creative bunch. We have these four stages of, of deep non-REM sleep and all we could come up with was stages one through four but let's set that aside for a second so we know that all of those different stages of sleep perform different functions and are all necessary to come back to your question though exactly what is happening at night well let's take deep non-REM sleep uh, for a start the, the deepest stages of non-REM sleep that stage of sleep is actually critical for essentially clearing out all of the metabolic toxins that have been building up in your brain. Now, that may sound a little bit hand-waving, but there's actually very hard, good science from animal studies. When we are awake, we are essentially in a form of low-level brain damage. That's what wakefulness is. And we produce a variety of metabolic byproducts as a result of all of that waking brain cell combustion that we're doing. And it is during sleep at night when we clear that away. What is clearing that away? Well, it turns out that we made a discovery, which is a sewage system in your brain. Now, you have a sewage system in your body that you're probably familiar with called the lymphatic system. But your brain also has one. It's called the glymphatic system after the cells that produce it or, or compose the system called glial cells. And that sewage system within the brain, the glymphatic system, is not always on, at least not in highest flow capacity. It's only during sleep and particularly deep sleep at night where that cleansing system of the sewage network actually kicks into high gear. It increases by maybe two to three hundred percent relative to when we're awake. Why is this important? Well, one of the metabolic toxins that the glymphatic system clears away as we sleep at night is a toxic protein called beta amyloid. And beta amyloid is one of the leading candidate causes of Alzheimer's disease. And this is why we know that people who are not getting sufficient sleep across their lifespan are at a far higher risk probability of going on to develop Alzheimer's disease. The less sleep that you have, the less clearing away of that toxic byproduct. So that's one way, general way that we know that the brain gets essentially a refresh. We also know that different cognitive systems and networks within your brain undergo a restoration. For example, we know that learning and memory systems get overhauled. We take information that we've recently learned and we transfer it from short to long term memory during sleep which is essentially like hitting the save button on new memories. So it prevents you from forgetting by cementing and solidifying those memories into long-term storage sites. We also know that there is a clearing out of your short-term memory reservoir. It's perhaps a little bit like shifting files from a USB stick so that when you wake up the next day, you have this renewed capacity to start learning and acquiring new facts and information all over again. So that's a, that's a, a more um, specific way in which the brain actually gets an overhaul at night during sleep. We also know that the emotional circuits of the brain are changed and modified by sleep. There are deep emotional brain centers, very old evolutionary centers, specifically a, a structure called the amygdala, which controls the fight or flight response. And that structure, the amygdala, is normally regulated in us higher order primates, human beings specifically, by a part of the brain that sits just above your eyes called the prefrontal cortex, which 
acts a little bit like the CEO of the brain. It makes very high level executive top down control decisions. And when you've had a good night of sleep, that part of your frontal lobe has been reconnected to your deep Neanderthal amygdala fight or flight center of the brain. And it just regulates it. It's a little bit like a break to your emotional accelerator pedal. But when you don't get enough sleep, that connection is actually severed. And as a consequence, you become almost all emotional gas pedal and too little frontal lobe regulatory control break. So there are many different ways in which sleep generally and very specifically seems to regulate our brain. And I could also speak about the different ways that the that sleep actually reboots multiple systems within the body. But that's certainly the ways that in which it, it refreshes your brain. I want to dig into learning and productivity and kind of the emotional aspects. But before we do, tell me briefly about kind of the, the physiological and the body reset aspects of sleep as well. Firstly, we know that deep non-REM sleep that we described is perhaps one of the best forms of blood pressure medication that you could ever imagine. It's during that deep sleep that your heart rate actually drops, your blood pressure will lower. There are a variety of restorative uh, chemicals and hormones that are released, a growth hormone in particular, to actually restore the cells within the body. So it's fantastic for the cardiovascular system. We also know that it regulates your metabolic system. Specifically, it regulates insulin levels. And if you're not getting sufficient sleep, your blood glucose actually starts to become disrupted. And there are great studies now taking healthy people with no signs of diabetes. And after one week of five to six hours of sleep a night, their blood sugar is disrupted so profoundly that their doctor would subsequently classify them as being pre-diabetic. So that's how critical sleep is to, to maintaining the metabolic system. We also know that sleep is essential for another one of the major systems, the reproductive system. And here I'll speak frankly about testicles, because we know that men who are routinely getting just uh, five to six hours a night have significantly smaller testicles than those who are sleeping eight hours or more. In addition, men who report getting just five or six hours of sleep each night have a level of testosterone, which is that of someone 10 years their senior. In other words, a lack of sleep will actually age you by a decade in terms of that aspect of wellness and virility. We see very similar impairments in equivalent female reproductive hormones and health caused by a lack of sleep. So it's not just males who are uh, disrupted in that way. So there are a variety of systems within the body. It also regulates appetite and weight and your food consumption. We know, for example, that those individuals who are not getting enough sleep will have an imbalance in the two hormones that control your hunger and your food intake. Those two hormones are called leptin and ghrelin. Now, leptin, they sound like uh, hobbits, I know, but trust me, they are actually real uh, hormones. Leptin is the hormone that tells your brain you're satisfied with your food, you're no longer hungry, you should stop eating. Ghrelin is the antithesis of that. Ghrelin will actually signal to your brain that you are not satisfied by the food that you've just eaten, that you are still hungry, and that you should eat more. And people who are put on a regimen of just five or six hours of sleep for one week will have a marked reduction in leptin, the hormone that says, you're fine, you've eaten enough, you can stop eating, you're not hungry. And a marked increase in the hormone ghrelin, which tells you you're not satisfied with your food, you're hungry, and it's time to eat more. And that's why people will actually eat somewhere between three to 500 calories more each day when they're not getting sufficient sleep. I should also note, by the way, it's not just that you eat more, but what you eat is non-optimal when you're sleep deprived. Without sufficient sleep, you actually reach for the heavy hitting, stodgy carbohydrates, as well as high sugar foods and you stay away from the protein-rich foods. So in other words, you'll find yourself reaching for another slice of pizza rather than sort of leafy greens, kale, and, and beans. 
So it's not just that you eat more, it's, it's what you eat that is also detrimental too. So I hope that gives people just uh, a little bit of a few brush strokes as the bodily, uh, in terms of the bodily consequences. The one that we probably haven't mentioned though, which is perhaps most impacted is your immune system. We know that one night of four hours of sleep will drop critical anti-cancer fighting immune cells called natural killer cells by 70%, which is a truly remarkable state of immune deficiency, which happens very quickly within just one night. Secondly, we also know that the link between a lack of sleep and cancer has now become so strong that the World Health Organization recently classified any form of nighttime shift work as a probable carcinogen. In other words, jobs that may induce cancer because of a disruption of your sleep-wake rhythms. Um, we can look to more benign things too. We know that if you're getting just five hours of sleep in the week before you go and get your flu shot, you will only produce 50%, or in fact, less than 50% of the normal antibody response rendering that flu shot largely ineffective. Finally, we know that if you're getting just five hours of sleep a night, you are two to 300% more likely to catch a cold than someone who is getting eight hours of sleep a night. This was a remarkable study where they quarantined people in a hotel and they had tracked how much sleep that they were getting in the week before. And then they flushed up the nose of all of these individuals the flu virus. And then in the next few days, they looked to see how many of those individuals succumbed to the, succumbed to the, the flu, uh, how many got infected. And then they bucketed them on the basis of how much sleep that they had in the week before. And that's how they were able to come to that conclusion. So there really isn't any system within your body or process within the brain that isn't wonderfully enhanced by sleep when you get it or demonstrably impaired when you don't get enough. What a powerful statement. And I think that, I mean, just that sentence alone really succinctly summarizes, I think that, you know, the fundamental conclusion that the science is in across, you know, nearly every spectrum of the body, the brain, et cetera, that sleep is incredibly valuable and that eight hours of sleep specifically is, is really critical. I think it is. And I think what we know is that without sleep, there is low energy and disease. And with sleep, there is vitality and health. And the sleep loss epidemic is perhaps the greatest curable disease that no one is really talking about or effectively trying to solve. So I would simply say that the lack of sleep is both the most striking omission in the health conversation of today, and our lack of sleep is perhaps a slow form of self-euthanasia. So I want to I want to dig back into the relationship. Let's let's touch on learning and memory. Tell me a little bit more about the work you've done and some of the research around how sleep can kind of improve learning and memory. So sleep actually is beneficial for memory in at least three ways that we've now discovered. And this is the work that we've been doing or some of the work that we do at my sleep center. First, we know that you need sleep before learning to essentially prepare your brain perhaps a little bit like a dry sponge, ready to initially soak up new information the next day. And so we did a study where we tested a very simple hypothesis. Is it wise to pull the all-nighter? Is it a good thing or a bad thing? And we took a group of uh, individuals and we either gave them a full night of sleep or we kept them awake throughout the night. And then the next day we wedged them inside an MRI scanner. And then we had them try and learn a whole list of new facts as we were taking snapshots of brain activity. And then we tested them to see how effective that learning had been. And firstly, what we found is that when we put those two groups head to head, there was a 40% deficit in the ability of the brain to make new memories without sleep. And just to frame that in context, it would simply be the difference between acing an exam and failing it miserably. What we went on to discover from the brain scans, however, was why the brain was failing to lay down those new memories. There's a structure in our brains on the left and the right side called the hippocampus. And you can think of the, the hippocampus a little bit like the memory inbox of the brain in that it's actually very good at receiving new memory files and holding on to them initially. And when we looked at that structure in those people who'd had a full night of sleep, we saw lots of healthy learning-related activity. 
Yet in those people who were sleep deprived, we actually couldn't find any significant activity whatsoever. So it was almost as though sleep deprivation had shut down your memory inbox, as it were, and any new incoming files, um, they were just being bounced. You couldn't effectively uh, commit new experiences to memory. If people would like to just sort of understand what that means in terms of the hippocampus. I'm sure many people listening have probably seen the movie Memento. And in that movie, that gentleman has damage to the brain and specifically to this structure, the hippocampus. And from that point forward, he can no longer make any new memories. He's what we call in neurology, uh, densely amnesic. And that part of his brain was the hippocampus. And it is the very same structure that your lack of sleep will actually attack and prevent your brain from actually laying down and, and, and placing those new memories into a fixed state within the brain. So that's the, the first way that sleep is good for learning and memory. But you also need sleep, not just before learning, but also after learning, but for something different now. Sleep after learning will essentially hit the save button on those new memories, and it will essentially solidify those memories into the neural architecture of the brain. As we mentioned before, it sort of actually will transfer those memories, almost like packets of information being transferred across a network from a short-term vulnerable storage site to the more permanent long-term storage center within the brain, which is called the cortex, this wrinkled mass that sits on top of your brain. And that means that when you come back the next day, those memories are protected and safe and you will be able to remember rather than those memories being vulnerable to being overwritten or lost, for example, to the ravage of time, which means that they are ultimately forgotten. We also know a little bit about how sleep not only transfers memories during sleep, but even strengthens those memories. It's during sleep that the brain actually replays the information that you've recently learned. And these are studies done in humans, but also in animals. They were actually placing electrodes into the brains of rats, and they were having them run around a maze. And as they were running around the maze and learning the maze, all of these different brain cells would fire in a specific signature pattern, which was essentially the imprinting of the memory. And if you were to sort of add different tones to them, it would sound a little bit like um, sort of that the the brain is sort of imprinting this memory as the rat is running around the maze. And lo and behold, what happens is that when you then let the rat sleep, but keep recording and keep eavesdropping on the brain, what do you think reemerges? It's exactly the same pattern. The rat is replaying those memories. What's incredible, however, is that it's actually replaying them at somewhere between 10 to 20 uh, times faster. So rather than it's actually it's it's this high speed fidelity replay. And we think that that actually helps score the memory trace into the brain in a strengthened manner, almost like etching on the surface of glass. You're really strengthening that neural circuit. So that's sleep after learning to strengthen individual memories and, I guess, essentially future-proof that information within the brain. The, there is a final third way that sleep actually helps memory that we've discovered, which I think is perhaps most exciting. Sleep doesn't just simply strengthen individual memories, and it's that strengthening of individual memories, by the way, that happens during deep, non-rapid eye movement sleep or dreamless sleep. But sleep also then actually interconnects those new memories together and interconnects new information with all of your pre-existing back catalog of autobiographical stored information. So essentially what sleep is doing, and this is actually the work of rapid eye movement sleep, of dream sleep, is that you're starting to collide information together within the brain. It's a little bit like group therapy for memories. And what you awake with the next morning is a revised mind-wide web of information within the brain. It's a new associative network, or at least not a radically new associative network, but it's an updated and it's a modified associative network. 
And that's the reason that you can come back the next day having extracted and divine creative novel solutions to previously impenetrable problems that you were facing. And it's probably the reason and we now know this, for example, that sleep will actually provide almost a threefold advantage in problem solving relative to an equivalent time period spent awake. And that science is now very well, I think, rendered and and described. So there probably is a reason that, you know, you're never told to stay awake on a problem. And in every language that I've inquired about to date, that phrase sleeping on a problem seems to exist. So it seems to transcend cultural boundaries. It's a phenomenon that is common across the globe. I should also note, by the way, that we, the, the British, we say you sleep on a problem. I believe, and please correct me if anyone knows this, but I believe the French translation is a little closer to you sleep with a problem rather than you sleep on a problem. And I think that says so much about the romantic difference between the, the British and the French. But I, I'll digress before I lose my British passport. There. That's great. Yeah, that's a, that's a funny anecdote and probably true. But I, I think that that sort of you know, I've seen the phrase creative incubation in, in some research around creativity and some of the science behind, you know, kind of what you're describing. And, and and to me, it makes so much sense that the more you give the brain the ability to process something, when you come back to that problem, you're going to be much more creative. You're going to be much more effective at solving. That's right. And it's it's not just sleep, by the way. If you If it's a complex problem, simple problems tend to benefit from deliberative focused thought. But complex problems, problems where there are maybe, you know, 10, 20, 80 different variables, you know, and you could think of this as something very crass, you know, do you, what type of knife or fork set do you buy, you know, and there's maybe just three or four different variables versus what type of car do you buy where there's maybe 16 different features of variance that you have to choose between. Well, the more complex a problem is, the more benefit there is to actually stepping away and stopping consciously thinking about it. That's where the non-conscious brain seems to go to work. And it seems to be able to distill amounts of information that we just can't consciously juggle all up in the air at the same time when we're awake. It's just too much for our working memory. And if you were to think of perhaps what the extreme version of that non-conscious processing would be, you would probably design a system that looks very similar to sleep. And that's exactly why sleep provides those creative benefits. It's essentially informational alchemy that occurs overnight. This episode of The Science of Success is brought to you by our partners at BetterHelp. That's BetterHelp. H-E-L-P. You'll get 10% off your first month by going to BetterHelp. Once again, that's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash S-O-S today for 10% off your first month. Let me ask you, what interferes with your happiness? Is there something preventing you from achieving your goals? I know there have been plenty, plenty of times getting too far into my own head has kind of gotten in my way limiting beliefs, thoughts of doubt. It can all build up inside you and become paralyzing or cause counterproductive behaviors to form. BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. You'll get timely and thoughtful responses, plus you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions, all without dealing with one of my least favorite things ever, the waiting room. It's effective and more affordable than traditional online counseling, and financial aid is available. Licensed professionals are on staff who specialize in things like depression, stress, anxiety, relationships, trauma, and even more. Plus, everything you share is completely confidential. In fact, so many people have been using BetterHelp, they are recruiting additional counselors in all 50 states right now. If you want to start living a happier life today, as a listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting betterhelp.com slash SOS. Join over 1 million people taking charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash SOS for 10% off your first month today. So I want to segue now and get into strategies for sleeping more effectively. We've talked 
at length about how important sleep is, both from sort of avoiding a tremendous amount of negative consequences, but also in producing uh, a, a myriad of positive benefits. Tell me about, you know, for somebody who maybe has trouble sleeping or, or just in general, what are some of the basic interventions that we can that we can implement in our lives to sleep better? These tips, I, I, I suppose, and again, I'm not just going to tell you the, the, the rules. I want to try and explain the reasons for each of these rules. I, I do warn people that, they, that some of them are probably not necessarily desirable. It makes me very unpopular, but here they are. The first overarching rule, of course, is that you just have to carve out an eight-hour non-negotiable sleep opportunity every night. And it sounds crass and it sounds hokey, but I, I do this in my life as well. I'm not just saying this because I've just written a book and I sort of want to practice what I seem to be preaching. But it's from a very selfish perspective because I know the evidence so well. And if you knew the evidence as I do, which and I hope people will do after reading the book, you just wouldn't do anything different. You know, I don't want a shorter life. I don't want a life filled with disease and pain and sickness and suffering. So that's why I do give myself a non-negotiable eight-hour opportunity every night. Once you've got that in place, and I don't think it's insurmountable, people are doing wonderful things in terms of actually committing non-negotiable time to exercise and people are trying to eat more healthily. So I think I don't think sleep is a lost cause in this regard. Once you're getting that opportunity, then I think there are five things that you can do. If there is one thing that you do from all of these tips, it is this regularity. Go to bed at the same time and wake up at the same time, no matter what, no matter whether it's the weekend or the weekday. Even if you've had a bad night of sleep, still wake up at the same time the next day, accept that it's going to be a bit of a tricky day, but then just get to bed early the following evening and then you will reset. Because if you sleep in late for whatever reason, you're not going to feel tired until later that following evening and you start to drift forward in time and it's called social jet lag. And that has marked deleterious consequences to your health and to your sleep. So regularity is key. The second is temperature. Keep it cool. Keep your bedroom around about 68 degrees is optimal for most people, which is probably colder than you think or about 18 and a half degrees Celsius. The reason is this, that your body needs to drop its core temperature by about uh, two to three degrees Fahrenheit in order to initiate sleep. And that's the reason that you will always find it easier to fall asleep in a room that's too cold than too hot because at least the cold room is moving your brain and body in the right thermal direction that it actually wants to go to for sound and healthy long sleep. So try to keep your temperature uh, in the bedroom cool. Um, wear socks if you get cold feet. Some people complain about this, so it's okay to wear those socks, but keep the bedroom cool. Another way that you can exploit this hack is actually to take a hot bath before bed or a hot shower. The bath is better if you look at the evidence. Most people think that when they have a hot bath, they get into bed, they're nice and warm, and that's what lets them fall asleep more easily. It's actually the opposite. When you get into a bath, all of the blood comes from the core of your body out to the surface. That's why you get that rosy glow. It's what's called mass vasodilation. And once you get out of the bath with all of that blood near the surface of your skin, you have this huge, massive thermal dump. You get this evacuation of heat from the body, which plummets your core temperature, and that's why you'll fall asleep uh, more quickly and more soundly. The third tip is light, and actually darkness more specifically. We are actually a dark, deprived society in all first world nations, and you need darkness to allow the release of a critical hormone called melatonin. And melatonin will time the normal healthy onset of sleep. If you've got lots of light on inside of the house during the evening, and especially if you're looking and staring at those LED screens from phones, tablets, laptops, etc., that will actually fool your brain into thinking it is still daytime and it will shut off melatonin. So you won't be releasing melatonin. And there were studies done where they had people reading on an iPad for one hour before bed. And if I was doing that here in California, their data demonstrated that my release and peak of melatonin 
didn't happen or was shifted by three hours uh, forward in time. So I would essentially be close to Hawaii in terms of my internal clock timing for sleep rather than California. So keep it dim. You can turn down half of the lights in the house in the evening. You don't need all of them on in the last hour before bed. Also stay away from screens in the last hour and try and use blackout curtains. That can actually be very helpful. The fourth tip is not to stay in bed if you have been awake for longer than 20 minutes. And this applies to whether you're trying to fall asleep or whether you've woken up and are trying to fall back asleep. The reason is this, your brain is a remarkably associative device. And if you are lying in bed awake, it quickly learns that being in bed is about being awake rather than being asleep. So you need to break that association. So after 20 minutes or so, if you haven't fallen asleep, get up, don't get too stressed, go to a different room and in dim light, perhaps just read a book, no screens, no eating. And only when you feel sleepy should you return to bed. And in that way, you will actually relearn the association between your bed being about being asleep rather than being awake. I would note that some people actually don't like the idea of getting out of bed. It's dark, maybe they're warm, and maybe it's cold in the rest of the house. And I understand that. Another way to try and help you get back to sleep that has good proven clinical trial data behind it is actually meditation. I'm actually quite a hard-nosed scientist, and when I was looking into this evidence as I was writing the book, I was really quite skeptical. And the studies were very clear, very well done, some of them out of Stanford here, uh, just down the way from me. And so much so that I actually started meditating my myself, and that was seven months ago, and I'm now a regular meditator. And I, if I'm traveling, going through jet lag, for example, and struggling with sleep, I will actually uh, use a meditation relaxation practice. The final tip is the one that really makes me deeply unpopular. Well, I'm deeply unpopular just generally as a person anyway, but this is the one that really makes me unpopular with people. No caffeine afternoon and avoid alcohol in the evenings. Uh, forego the nightcap. And I'll explain both. Everyone knows, of course, that caffeine activates you. It's a class of drugs that we call the stimulants, and it can keep people awake. What people may not know, however, is that for those people who say, well, I can drink an espresso after dinner, and I fall asleep fine, and I stay asleep. That may be true. However, the depth of the deep sleep that you have when caffeine is swilling around within your brain during sleep is nowhere near as deep as if you had not had that cup of coffee in the evening. And as a consequence, people will wake up the next morning, they won't feel refreshed or restored. They don't remember having a problem falling asleep or staying asleep, so they don't equate it with the cup of coffee they had the night before. But now they find themselves reaching for two cups of coffee or three cups of coffee in the morning, which essentially is building a dependency, an addiction cycle. So that's the, the, the issue with caffeine, and that's why the suggestion is stop caffeine after midday uh, and certainly after 2 p.m. Alcohol is probably the most misunderstood drug when it comes to sleep. Alcohol is a class of drugs that we call the sedative hypnotics, and sedation is not sleep. So many people say, well, I have a nightcap, I have a quick whiskey, or and it, it puts me to sleep. It's great. It's actually not true. What you're simply doing is you're sedating your cortex, you're knocking out your brain, essentially. So you're not getting into natural sleep. And then there are two more problems with alcohol. Firstly, it will fragment your sleep. So you will wake up many more times throughout the night, which leaves you with what we call unrestorative sleep. And the final thing is that alcohol is one of the best chemicals that we know at blocking your dream sleep, your REM sleep, which is essential for not just creativity and that associative type of memory processing that we spoke about. REM sleep is also critical for emotional and mental health. It is during REM sleep when we provide our brain a form of emotional first aid. And you won't be getting that if you're blocking uh, REM sleep by way of alcohol. So those would be the five tips to, to better sleep. And hopefully they, they help some folks. And I'm also happy to speak a little bit about sleeping pills. They're also misunderstood. But those would be for uh, most people, the five tips that I would offer. Great advice. And, and, and I try to implement as many of those as possible. You know, one of the things specifically caffeine is something that I used to drink kind of at my peak. 
uh, about a cup of coffee, I mean, a pot of coffee a day. And, wow. uh, and now I basically don't consume any caffeine. And, and when I do, I sell, you know, I limit myself no caffeine afternoon, maybe one cup of tea is kind of the maximum. And I've noticed a huge impact on my, on, on that impacting my sleep. Sorry, were you going to say something? Yeah, no, I was just going to say, I mean, it's immensely wise. And it's, you know, one of the problems with a lack of sleep is that you quickly reset your sort of perception of your effectiveness and your health. You just think, well, this is how I am now at this age, not realizing that you could actually be a far better version of yourself, both mentally, cognitively, and physiologically, if you were just to start getting sufficient sleep. And I think many people fail to realize that with caffeine, especially that it's only when they come off caffeine, do they really start to feel both the benefits of all of the side effects that normally come with high caffeine use, but especially the benefits on sleep. You know, it's like sort of, you know, wiping a fogged window and you finally can start to see clearly through it. That's the benefit of a full restorative night of sleep. I have a couple sort of short questions all around specific sleep strategies or tactics. Let's start with you, you touched on sleeping pills. Tell me about sleeping pills. Do they work? And, you know, if so, why or why not? There are no sleeping medications that we have currently that produce naturalistic sleep. The current class of drugs that you will be prescribed are called sedative hypnotics. And again, as we mentioned with alcohol, sedation is not sleep. So the sleep that you have when you're on sleeping pills, if I were to show you the electrical signature of your sleep, if you were to come to my laboratory, it would not be the same on sleeping pills as it would be if you're just having naturalistic, healthy sleep. That's the first uh, thing. The second thing, and I go to great lengths in a whole chapter in, in the book to discuss this, is that people are probably not aware of the risks of sleeping pills. They have not been communicated to the public adequately. Firstly, we know that sleeping pills are associated with a far higher risk of death. They're also associated with a significantly higher risk of cancer and infection. Now, we don't yet know if this is causal versus simply associational, but what I wanted to do is to try to get that information out to the public so they at least could be armed with the knowledge and make an informed choice with their doctor when they go and uh, see the surgery. So... I think that's the that's I think one of the the biggest problems with sleeping pills is the 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 misunderstood nature about what they give you and the dangers. People also don't necessarily have to be taking uh, sleeping pills. I should note there is a safe and non pharmacological alternative which is just as effective. It is called cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia or CBTI for short. And you work with a therapist for a couple of weeks. And as I mentioned, it's just as powerful as sleeping pills in the short term. But better still, once you finish that short therapy phase, you continue to maintain that better sleep. Unlike sleeping pills, when you come off those, you tend to actually have what's called rebound insomnia, where your sleep is as bad, if not worse, than when you started. So I think people can revisit the their sleep issues with their doctor. And I'm not trying to shame people who are on sleeping pills. I'm not trying to make you feel bad if you are. I'm very sensitive to the desire for better sleep and and I'm so sensitive to the issue of insomnia. It's a desperate, desperate state. But you should be aware of what sleeping pills are, what they do, and what the alternatives are. What about taking a, a melatonin supplement? Melatonin is useful in the circumstance of jet lag to try and reset your body clock in a new time zone. And there, you should take it 30 to 60 minutes before you want to get to sleep in the new time zone. Melatonin works to essentially time the onset of your sleep. So I guess the analogy would be if you think about the, the 100 meter race in the Olympics, well, melatonin is the starting official who has the starter gun. It's melatonin that brings all of the different ingredients of the sleep race to the starting line and then starts the race to sort of uh, in its entirety. It begins the sleep race. But melatonin itself does not actually participate in the race of sleep, in the generation of that sleep race. That's a whole different set of chemicals. And as a consequence, that's why actually melatonin, when you are in a, a new time zone and you're stable now in that new time zone, if you're a young, healthy individual, 
then melatonin actually isn't effective as a sleeping aid. It doesn't actually help if you look at the studies. That said, I would note that for those people who are taking melatonin and they feel as though it helps their sleep, well, then I usually tell people continue on. It's because the placebo effect is one of the most reliable effects in all of pharmacology. So no harm, no foul if you think it's working for you. And what about napping? Is napping something, if if you're sleep deprived, can you catch up with a nap? You unfortunately cannot catch up on sleep. So sleep is not like the bank. And this is another myth that I tried to sort of deconstruct in the book. You can't accumulate a debt, let's say during the week, and then hope to pay it off at the weekend. Sleep just doesn't work like that. There is no credit system or there's no credit sleep cell within the brain. You can, if you are sleep deprived, take a nap and overcome some of the basic sleepiness. Your reaction times will improve a little bit after a nap, but you don't actually overcome all of the higher level cognitive issues such as decision making, learning and memory, focused attention, all of those types of things that we know are with that buckle and collapse by way of a lack of sleep. Naps just don't seem to be able to overcome those. So you can't overcome, you can't bank sleep and you can't sleep off a debt. Uh, I see this in my students. It's sort of what I would call sleep bulimia, which is where they're binging on sleep at the weekend and then they're sort of have, try, sort of taking too little sleep during the week. It's this binge purge kind of cycle. I would also say naps just more generally are a double-edged sword. If during the day when we're awake, we actually build up a, a chemical pressure in our brain and it's a sleepiness pressure. Now, it's not a hydraulic pressure, don't worry. As I said, it's a, it's a chemical pressure, and the chemical that builds up is called adenosine. And the more of that sleepiness chemical that you have, the more and more sleepy that you will feel. And after about 16 hours of being awake, you're nice and tired, and then you should fall asleep and stay asleep for about eight hours. And when we sleep, we remove that that sleepiness pressure. It's almost like a valve on a pressure cooker. We sort of release that sleepiness steam, as it were. And this is where I come back to naps. If you nap too late in the day, you will actually release some of that healthy sleepiness, which means that when it comes time to sleep normally at night, you may actually struggle to fall asleep or at least stay asleep. So the advice would be this. If you are someone who can nap regularly, and you don't struggle with your sleep at night, then naps are just fine. But if you can't nap regularly and or you are having difficulties with your sleep at night, then the advice is you shouldn't nap, you should stay awake, build up that healthy sleepiness, and then you'll have a better night of sleep because of it. What about someone who's in a a situation, let's say like a new parent, is there anything that they can go through, obviously, you know, very sort of chronically sleep deprived state. Is there any strategy for them to be able to implement that would help them battle through that in some way? Some parents describe trying to work better shifts. And what I mean by that is in two ways. Firstly, some parents will sort of try to take early, you know, the early shift and then the, the late shift, you know, the sort of the first half of the night versus the second half of the night and switch between those two. And another way that you can do that on an informed choice is try to determine whether you are a a night owl or you're sort of a morning type, what we call a lark. That's actually genetically predisposed. It's called your, your chronotype. So if you are someone who likes to go to bed late and wake up late versus someone who likes to go to bed early and wake up early, that's not a choice. That's a genetic mandate that's being given to you in your DNA code. And you can try to ask in the couple, you know, are you someone who, you know, would prefer to wake up early and go to bed early? In which case, could you take the morning shift, the late morning shift? And if I'm someone who likes to go to bed late and wake up late, well, then it's easier for me to actually take the first half of the night and then sleep for the second half of the morning and sleep late. So you can think about split shifts like that. Some people will also flip flop back and forth. Uh, Some people will say, well, I'll take the next two nights and you get good sleep and then I'll take, and then we switch over and you take two nights and they try to sort of mix and match it in that way too. So, but it's a desperately difficult situation. And in part, we were not actually designed to be family units like this. If you look at hunter-gatherer tribes who have not been touched by 
sort of the electrical influence, then they actually tend to sleep in groups, you know, restless legs dangling all over the place, arms intertwined, you know, whole families would sleep together and people would sort of take t- turns in terms of caring for the young. So it's a lot that, to ask of parents. Uh, and those are some of the ways that you can try to overcome it. One other question, and this is kind of uh, out of left field a little bit, but I'm curious, have you seen or, or, or studied anything around the, the neurotransmitter GABA and its relationship with sleep? So GABA is the principal inhibitory neurotransmitter of the brain. And the way that most sleep make, sleeping medications work right now, and you can just name your favorite one and it will work in this way, is by essentially trying to activate the receptors in the brain for GABA. And those receptors essentially are like the red lights on your neurons. They stop them firing. They stop them from going. And so Drugs that try to target the GABA system within the brain are really quite blunt instruments. And that's why sleeping pills, which act exactly in this way, are really not precise uh, tools. Sleep is a remarkably complex neurophysiological and neurochemical ballet. If you look at it, all of these different stages of sleep, neurotransmitters going up and down and brain networks ebbing and flowing. And so to think that you can essentially recreate something that is so complex and so bi-directional as sleep by simply just knocking the brain out and switching it off using GABA receptors is, is really just a, it's an unfortunate outcome of how poor our pharmacology is in this day and age. We just don't yet have the pharmacological precision and sophistication to mimic sleep at this stage. What's one piece of homework that you would give to a listener who wants to sleep better? I would say try giving yourself one week of eight hours of sleep and see if you feel any better. Just give it as a self-improvement test. Try it as a hack that if you are one of those people who are sort of into the quantified self-movement and you're into self-experimentation, then just test out all of that which you've just heard in the past week and and just determine if you feel any better when you're sleeping eight hours every night and you regular each and every night versus a staccato sleep schedule where you're sleeping you know five hours then six hours then 12 hours and then five hours again And, and just ask yourself did that experiment work and is it in my favor do i feel any better and do i notice that improvement and for listeners who want to learn more and want to find you and, and your book online, what's the best place to do that? So they can find the book, which is called Why We Sleep, and they can find that online. Amazon holds it. You can find it from all of your major bookstores, both the major brands as well as all of the independents. It's on the list of most libraries too. If you if you don't want to part with your money, my publisher probably wouldn't like me saying that, but I really don't mind. It's about the knowledge uh, of the book, not the sales. If you want to uh, learn more about the work that I do, you can follow me on social media. I am at Sleep Diplomat, all one word, Sleep Diplomat. I'm on Twitter and also you can find me on LinkedIn. And also on the web, I am at, it is www.sleepdiplomat.com. Well, Matt, this has been a fascinating conversation. So much great information, practical strategies, tons and tons of science. Really appreciate it. Uh, Incredible insights. Thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing all of this wisdom. Well, thank you. And I have to say a a real thanks to you too. It's not just a, uh, you know, what people say at the end of these interviews, but, you know, I'm trying to fight this battle for sleep and I can only do so much by getting on shows or television, radio, or writing a book, for example, I need fantastic journalists and and media um, genius types to actually join and partner with me to get this message out. So I actually just want to thank you, Matt. Thank you for for being part of this this sleep mission. I'm I'm going to grant you now the the title of being a sleep ambassador for having me on the show. So so thank you very much. But sincerely, I, I really want to thank you. I, I desperately need to get this message out. So, And this portal is a remarkable way to, uh, to proclaim the, the virtues of sleep. So thank you. Thank you so much for listening to The Science of Success. 
We created this show to help you, our listeners, master evidence-based growth. I love hearing from listeners. If you want to reach out, share your story, or just say hi, shoot me an email. My email is matt at successpodcast.com. That's M-A-T-T at successpodcast.com. I'd love to hear from you, and I read and respond to every single listener email. I'm going to give you three reasons why you should sign up for our email list today by going to successpodcast.com, signing up right on the homepage. There's some incredible stuff that's only available to those on the email list, so be sure to sign up, including an exclusive curated weekly email from us called Mindset Monday, which is short, simple, filled with articles, stories, things that we found interesting and fascinating in the world of evidence-based growth in the last week. Next, you're getting an exclusive chance to shape the show, including voting on guests, submitting your own personal questions that we'll ask guests on air, and much more. Lastly, you're going to get a free guide we created based on listener demand, our most popular guide, which is called How to Organize and Remember Everything. You can get it completely for free, along with another surprise bonus guide by signing up and joining the email list today. Again, you can do that at successpodcast.com, sign up right at the homepage, or If you're on the go, just text the word SMARTER, S-M-A-R-T-E-R, to the number 44222. Remember, the greatest compliment you can give us is a referral to a friend, either live or online. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave us an awesome review and subscribe on iTunes because that helps boost the algorithm that helps us move up the iTunes rankings and helps more people discover the science of success. Don't forget, if you want to get all the incredible information we talk about in the show, links, transcripts, everything we discuss, and much more, be sure to check out our show notes. You can get those at successpodcast.com. Just hit the show notes button right at the top. Thanks again, and we'll see you on the next episode of The Science of Success.